Um, and it's just, it's the, I think it is the greatest job in the world. And I think about that every day when I wake up and I go to work. But in order to talk about waking up and going to work, I have to show you where it started. This is my car right here. This is uh, July 30th, 1988, and um, Lodge Freeway, and I'm living in Detroit, and I'm going out to the suburbs to a friend's house. We had a big flood, and at this time, I was a student at a community college before I transferred to the University of Missouri. And I always had one camera with me because I was, you know, had assignments. And the, the, the water here, um, the, the, uh, it backed up and everyone got stuck. And so I'm sitting there in my car waiting because I wanted to get to my friend's house for this party. And I was like, wait a minute, this could be a cool assignment for, you know, something to turn in for a spot news story uh, for, for OCC. So I got out and I climbed up the embankment, went over, and this was the days of, of black and white, of, of uh, film. And I shot six rolls of film. Our or an hour and a half went away, or passed by, got back in my car, the water left, and I went, started heading to my friend's house. And then I started thinking, hey, you know what, I could turn this in to, on Monday for an assignment, or I could turn around, go to the free press, which I've been reading for years because their photography, their photojournalism is absolutely spectacular, and I've always have fallen in love with their work. And I can take a chance, a scared young kid, go to the free press for the first time and see if they'd be interested. Well, the next day, they ran two pictures, that one and this one. And it was so, it was just like, I mean, I've got goosebumps right now, but even though it was so long ago, uh, I remember walking down the hall and seeing all this great work of photographers I, ex I admire and respect and look up to, and I'm in their presence. And that was just so cool as a 19-year-old. As a and uh, the other cool thing is it said, uh, photos by Eric Seals. And it was always one of my goals to work at the Free Press. And so I had my first picture ever published in the place I wanted to work. But the kicker is a week later, I got a check for $250 for running these two, for them uh, using these two pictures. And that, I mean, it's not the money. I mean, the money is great. But to, to realize that I could be challenged, have fun, be creative, and, and work a scene to death, and you're gonna pay me for it? I mean, get, I, that's insane. And that, that right there, that, that whole week was, the, was like the fork in the road for me. It was, it was the moment that I took the right path and not the left path. I could have taken the left path and gone to my friend's house. Who knows if I would have made connections with the free press then. So that's just how I got started. Anyway, thinking visually. Visual breadcrumbs is what I like to say is one of the things that you really need to have in order to have a really good picture story or a really good video story. And you really think about it as food for the eyes. I mean, just imagine if you, on a timeline in Premiere Pro, let's say you have a two minute video. It takes a lot for someone to watch a two minute video. Most people, 30 seconds to a minute, right? Some, some of the videos in the docs I do are eight minutes, 12 minutes, an hour long. That's a lot. So how do you get people to watch? One, you obviously need a really good story, strong characters, but you need visual breadcrumbs. And that is basically really nice visuals all along the timeline. So you start off with a really strong visual, they look at it, and then you feed them a little bit more, you know, t five seconds later, and then 10 seconds later. At the same time, you, you have really good editing, really good sequencing, really good sound, net sound, um, transitions, all that stuff. And so by the end of the video, they, they're hooked because they've watched. They watch the whole thing because you fed them. You fed their brain with what the story you're telling, but you also fed their eyes visually so they kept watching. And for me, um, one of the best um, compliments I can get, or I think anyone who does video storytelling can get, is when they watch your work and they say, I had no idea that was eight minutes long. I got lost in your story. And this is a good, getting lost can be bad, on directions, going places, <laughs> but getting lost in your story is a good thing. So shot variety. Sorry, I've got to get your water. Shot variety. So my first internship uh, in 1992 at the Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel, a photographer told me, Eric, when you go out and you're taking pictures, just don't shoot straight on. Cover the world, cover the, whatever it is like the world. Stand up on a chair, get down on the ground. Do all these type of things to cover the world. You know, whatever your subject is, you <laughs> cover the world because it allows visual variety, it allows you to explore the space and see things differently. 
Maybe the picture laying down and you're getting dirty and looking up at something, maybe that's the better picture than, than eye level or, or, or shooting down on it off of a ladder. You never know, but th that's the great thing about photojournalism and video storytelling is you get to explore. You get to explore the space. And that's something that I think kids, sorry, <laughs> students need to, to do, do a lot more. So by visually exp exploring, just don't use one focal length. And a lot of kids, a lot of students now are just like using the 35 millimeter lens with their mirrorless camera and things like that. Um, use more than one focal length. Zoom with your feet and not the lens. That happens so much at workshops I, I teach at. I see people just standing there with the 7200 and they zoom to get the picture. Be proactive and move to the scene, move to the person. Don't just sell for one angle, like I said. Um, the best pictures aren't on your feet. And then be patient. Let the moment happen. Don't rush it. Just, just be patient. Let it happen. Be aware of your surroundings. And then moments, they happen so quick, you have to make sure that the students, that they're so in tune with their camera that they can photograph in their sleep. They know, I can look right now and, and, and look at you, and I can tell you the exposure, um, the f-stop, the aperture, all that, all that. I can tell you what it is because I've done it for so long. So that allows me to focus on the moments. Like if, if there's a moment where you're excited, I can get that because I don't have to worry about the exposure. That's very, very key. So like, this is me in Turkey and you know, shooting these guys, I just decided to get down on the ground. And you know, just, you just, it's just fun to explore is what I'm saying. Um, like I'm always probing and I'm looking uh, at every angle to see if it's gonna work visually. And you also want to shoot and explore so that you've got a visual variety to advance the frame, which works great in picture stories, but it also works great in video storytelling. Your visuals have to have a purpose. You just don't take a picture just for the hell of it. You take a picture because it has to have meaning, it has to have context, because people's <coughs> eyes are gonna be looking at it. They're, they're longing to learn from you, from your work, from your visuals. So make sure that you have a purpose in every picture that you take. So now I'm gonna get into a little technical thing um, about wide, medium, and tights. Um, a lot of people, um, don't follow this anymore, I've noticed. And, and I think it's, um, I don't know if it's laziness or they're just fine with a, a one, a 35 millimeter lens and that's all they use. But you need wide, medium, and tight. They're great for sequences in picture stories or in video. It gives readers visual variety. And there's so many that you can get, you can, you can get as long as you focus on it and you're, you're really proactive, that it really helps the story overall. So for wides, a really wide picture is going to show you, um, you know, where are we? It gives you a really, really good sense of place, and it's an establishing shot. But a wide also tells you, okay, who else is here? Who else is here in this story? Who's with us? Who are the people that are involved? And it really does build on the atmosphere of a story. So for example, this is something I did uh, last um, October. Uh, I was up in Canada, northern Canada, f for five days with a reporter on a story um, that I'm going to show a little bit later, um, and that's Joe Murphy. He's a homeless, uh, a homeless former NHL hockey player, uh, first round draft pick in 1986. And we had heard that there was this homeless guy living up in, in uh, Canada, and he was a former Red Wing. And in Detroit, people bleed Red Wing red. And so we went up there on sight unseen, hoping we'd be able to see him. And we, we, found, we asked around, found out where he was. This is the very first picture I made before we even went up and approached him. Um, he, was, he was just sleeping, he was drugged out. And so, you know, I'm, at this point I'm shooting stills on video and I'll get into that later. Sometimes you have to do a mix and it, it's hard to do. But so I shot stills of him, but it's a wide shot. It, it's an establishing shot. And it shows exactly where he sleeps every night. It shows the condition of it. And then, you know, in terms of video, Wide shots really give you a really pretty scenic scene. Um, and so I spent um, seven days on a freighter going from Detroit up uh, Lake Huron to Lake Superior and back. And wides were very, very important for that because people love freighters, people love the beauty of the Great Lakes. So I had to give that to them. This job is a 24 hour day, seven day a week operation. Here we are, we're a trucking company on water. Basically time is money. The crew members on board this boat. I mean, I cannot do it without the people that are here. Cleaning, the scraping. This is 
basically our, when you turn up the air conditioning to 72 degrees, they should be thinking about the ship that just went down the river that, that delivered the coal to put the power into their home. <clears throat> the Great Lakes is one of the most beautiful places on earth, and it's wonderful. <clears throat> When you can see the water as calm as it is, and hardly any wind out, and uh, the sun <coughs> rising, you know it's going to be a good day. So those are a lot of whys. So imagine that story mixed in with, with, with tights and mediums that I'll show you in a second. Um, it really goes back to those visual breadcrumbs. It, it, it oozes with art. It oozes with the sunset, it oozes with just motion, and you're transfixed to that screen. That's the job of a, of a, of a photojournalist, that's the job of a video storyteller, to make people just be transfixed on that screen, whether it's your, your, your Mac or your iPhone. So medium, medium does show what's taking place um, in the character's surroundings. It does help provide scale in context, so location, and also, medium really does give really good body language and emotions and quirks, and it does reveal more about them. And I'll show you that in a second. But, but also, when you have a medium shot, in addition to a tight shot, it does allow viewers to pick up on, on little things about these people that make them so, so interesting. So, like for Joe again, uh, after we had went up and, and talked with them, and he said, hey, that's great, the free press is here, you guys hang out with me as long as you want. Um, I just started, started photographing him, and, and he was one of these people that was just, he left, he did his own thing, and we just followed. He didn't do any posing, he didn't do any, anything like that. He just was himself, which is, which is uh, what you want in, in storytelling. Um, so that's like more of like your medium shot. And then this is like a short clip. So this is a, a medium shot. I was down the street, and I knew ahead of time that he was gonna be walking down this way to go to the McDonald's because they give him free coffee because they feel sorry for him and he gets an egg McMuffin and things like that. So I knew he'd be walking down there, so I just drove, parked myself there for about a half hour and just waited, which is something else, patience. You have to have patience. You have to ask a lot of questions so that you know in advance where to be, what spot to be, because we're all very ethical people and we can't say, hey, come this way now, because we're not movie directors, we're, we're journalists. We tell the truth with cameras. So, yeah, I sat here for a half hour, but that's just part of the job. The weirdest thing about this whole story is everything he tells us. We don't know what's truth, what's truth in his brain, what, what is reality. He talks to himself a lot. He's a good guy. He's dealing with some mental health issues. That's the really reporter I work with. I know what those mental health issues are, and I don't think he's, he knows. He's got a CSD life. He said his old head's hat. I got I I could always do these things. I um I'm trying to say I'm bad that there's not there's no much. It's not a practice in this house. So that's like your your medium shot. And then your tight detail. <coughs> Details are great for showing emotion, and showing the person's uh, personality. Um, and tight allows the viewers to really connect with that person, whether it's the first thing they see or somewhere in the middle. You always want really nice, tight pictures, so make sure to tell your students about that because it does, it does make people connect with it, and it does do great sequencing. So again, back to Joe. Um, I covered him like I covered the world, you know? I laid on the ground, I was on top of them, I was to the side, I was everywhere. Everything I shoot, I cover the world. And that's something that, you know, tell your students as well. Um, and so like on this, you know, I, I whoops, sorry. I, fo I focused, uh, I had my focus right here because it, you know, it's the, uh, it's one of those Swisher Sweets um, cigarette, cigarettes or cigars. And then you can see, it's not great on the screen, but you can see his dirty hand nails or hand um, fingernails. And so what a tight picture, that shows personality, it shows, it shows what he's into, it shows what he does, it shows his state of mind and his, the state of his, of his body or his being. Um, and then this is like, like a couple of, of tight examples. You'll tear your car up, or bust your tires or your rims up. <coughs> Coming down this street. The uh, trim of a tire is probably about six inches, so your whole tire is in the actual hole. You consider that the thickness of that. 
you know, which is crazy. That's your rim in the actual hole. And I told Marcus, you will never lose that focus and that drive. <laughs> he said, well, you know what will be my focus? I always think about my siblings. And when I think about them, I just get a new focus. He said, I refocus. When I went to college, I didn't have that burden on me. That's a burden. But for him, it's not a burden. It's maybe his destiny. So for those tight, the two tight shots I want to talk about briefly, uh, the, the pothole, you, you hear, you can, it was tight, you know, you can see the, the tire, you can see the, the gravel, and then I heard someone over here, ugh, you know, that's what you want when you're telling, when you're doing video stories, you want a, 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 a reaction, you want an emotional response from somebody, and you did that because you could feel it, right? But that meant because I was close to it, I was tight, and I also had my lavalier right near that pothole, so you could get that rich sound. So it's just so much fun to explore with, with wide, medium, and tight. And then the other one um, was Marcus Bugs, that first shot of his eyes. If you notice, I was so tight on him, you could, yes, you can see, the, the, you can see in the catch you can see the, the computer uh, in his eye. So that's what you want. You know, it's just those little details that just really help elevate the story a little bit more as you go along. So to review, um, wide, medium, tight, close up, even details. These are um, the building. These are some of the building blocks of good visuals. Um, you have you have to have this because it makes your editing better. It makes you makes you shoot and see better. So next, I'm going to talk a little bit about mastering motion, and I'm going to talk about um, entering and exit the frame. So. Imagine you've got your, you know, you've got your viewfinder, you know, your your, rec, your uh, rectangle, and you're you're photograph you're photographing someone or you're shooting a video of them. You don't shoot them as they're going and then you stop here. You've got to let them go all the way to the very end. You want to go let the person go from A to Z, um, and by doing that, it gives you a good transition to the next frame or the next scene because they're, they're walking out of one scene into another. Um, and that does indicate travel or movement. And that's something that a lot of people don't do. As a matter of fact, I was at a, a workshop in Syracuse uh, two or three weeks ago teaching. And for my students, they did not understand this. And I had to go out with one of them to show them why um, enter and exit was so important. And then we came back and we looked at the computer. We, we compared mine to theirs. Then they understood. So a lot of times, you just got to just either do it for them or go with them and give them some coaching, and then they, they understand it. But to ask them to go out and do it on their own, yes, it's great for, to let them try and fail and learn from their mistakes, but sometimes students need that extra push, that professional push from us professionals. And so here's an a exit frame. They see frame. history in front of them. All 436 feet of the height. So it stops, right? Yeah. And yeah, it's. So that's what you want. You want to go from A, let start at A, end at Z, or after Z. Um, matching action. Um, this is something that, that works much better for video uh, than it does for photojournalism. Um, but matching action, you know, the same action that's done multiple times over and over again, it does add visual variety to your story. And because it's done so many times, you have so many angles and so many ways that you can shoot it. And I'm gonna show you an example of, of these coffins that um, I did this for. Yes, sir. So the scuba diver, you had that intro shot. Yes. Thing. Was that one continuous clip or was it two different clips? Nope, that's just, it's just they one. They see history in front of them. All 436 feet of the hydrants. It's just one shot. And, and that's 300 feet down in Lake Huron. I can only go to 30, um, 30 feet. Um, and it's really cold down there, like 30, 34, 35 degrees. So I had to literally teach these divers how to shoot underwater cinematography. So what I did is I went on YouTube, found some amazing underwater cinematography, and I made a three minute movie. And on the next time we went out uh, from um, uh, the shore of Michigan, about two and a half miles out into Lake Huron, I sat them all down and I gave them a lesson about enter, exit frame, holding the camera still. Don't shoot like a tourist and you know, don't do all this. Don't go in Stay still, let it come in, let it go out. It's so simple, but they just, they don't know. I mean, they're, that's not what they do. 
But I taught them that, and over the course of maybe three or four dives on different shipwrecks, uh, they, they, they nailed it. They really did really a good job. Um, so again, the matching action, um, when you do it right, it allows for the appearance of one continuous action. Mm -hmm. And it really, it's, it's actually a really cool thing when you do it right, because it, you use one camera, but man, it makes it look like you've got two or three cameras going, and you're a one-man one man band or one-person band. But if you do matching action right, it looks like you've got two or three cameras set up. Um, so this is what, oh, sorry. So to set this up really quick, it's, it's a very short clip. Um, there was a, a funeral home in Detroit, and um, they, it, it was abandoned, and they found all kinds of cre cremated remains. A lot of them were, were veterans from World War II, Vietnam, things like that. So this company, this, this funeral home uh, in, uh, in the suburb of Detroit, um, went up there, got the remains, brought them back. So the story was about the cremation, um, what happened, and then how they're honoring these vets by burying them, um, giving them their final, their, their tribute that they really deserve. So I spent a day shooting this. And so this is a clip that talks about matching action, or shows matching action. So here the casket's coming in. I'm sitting down in a chair. This is probably casket number six. So they go through. And then now I went, you cut, cut to the other scene where I'm inside. So if you so if you see this, is there a way to pause it? No, it's not. So they're coming through. Do you want me to pause it? Yeah, thanks. Thanks. So they're coming through, and then that that um, that inter exit. I did have them go all the way through, and then I hit I hit pause or I, I stopped it. Um, thanks, Al. And then it cuts to that. So, if, so you see, I got it, Al, thank you. <laughs> I'm feeling so powerful. <laughs> so, so here we are, uh, I'm in the seat, and now I'm here. Because there were six caskets, so the, I knew that this, and, and it was always the same guy, so this is this repetitive action I'm talking about. You know, you gotta be mindful and look out for that. You know, it's the same guys bringing in caskets after casket, so I knew to plant my butt in one of those chairs to get video of them coming and turning and going in. But then I knew to come over here and shoot wide to show the flag on the side, to show the, the other flag or the other uh, caskets, and then you see them coming in. And it works, so this is actually at the, the, the garage where they're putting them in. It works here, but I'm gonna show you where I failed miserably. And that's the other great thing about photojournalism and video you're never 100% successful, and that's okay. And that really is okay. You can't be great at this job. Your goal is to really improve and try, but you're not. But that's okay, don't let it get you down, you just keep pushing. And so I failed here, and I didn't realize I failed on this until last week when I was putting this together, I realized my error. So watch, hands it to him, he puts it in. I'll do it again. Exactly. So she hands it to him, and if you notice, it's, it's the, uh, it's the um, uh, remains with a white piece of paper on it. But the next frame, whoops, I did not notice that, you know, and I should have. Where was the continuity? Exactly, exactly. And I just, I didn't, you know, it's so fluid because there were, and I'm not making excuses, but there were, you know, seven, eight other people, other photographers around, and so you're working it and everything. So you have to always, you know, you, your, your brain's working so hard trying to get so many things from watching the sound, watching your exposure, watching the movement, but you gotta watch for the continuity, like you said. So now, this is the whirlpool. This is a, something that, that, that I, I've learned. So this is a Easter hair story, picture story I did um, on Saturday, the day before Easter. And um, the last, picture, I was focused on this little girl. Uh, she just got her hair done and everything, and so I wanted to do a portrait of her. So I'm standing on a ladder, again, covering your world, and shooting at her, and I'm starting to take pictures. But look, this woman's walking right in there, right? I should have noticed that. I should have not, I should have composed it, got my exposure good, and been patient and wait for the right moment, and I didn't do that. And here's what you need to do anytime, tell your students about the whirlpool. What you do is you frame it in your viewfinder, and then you take your eye and you just do a loop around 
the picture. And as you do that loop, you're adjusting. You're like, oh, wait a minute, there's a telephone pole. I'm gonna move over here. Oh, there's something there, I'm gonna move down. So you're almost like a, like a gimbal. You're always just kind of moving very by millimeters just to, to get the angle right. Then you press the button. And so, I mean, it's obviously, you know, look how distracting it is there, you know, versus here. And eventually that, that's the woman, she eventually moved out the way as she is walking, but I should have been patient and just waited for that moment to happen. Can you go back to that? I just want to see that. Which one? Right before the world pulls in. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yep. And then again, this was at um, the a Pride Parade, a Pride Festival in Detroit last Saturday. Look at this. Look at look what I did. Oh, yeah. Look what I did here. Yeah. You know? Come on, Eric. You know? Um, and I've done this for 25 years, but I'm always making mistakes. But that's okay, because I'm, I'm, I should be learning from them. But that, we make mistakes. But if you recognize the error, you're better off for it to not let it happen again, right? So, I have a guess who? Yes. With the, with the world pool, you said that was a, that was a portrait. Um, but you were also saying earlier, make sure in that, and this is something that, that I struggle with every now and then, um, trying to make sure that you're not creating an environment that didn't exist. Well, okay, so a portrait is almost like an illustration, right? It, it's you're allowed to control it because it's a portrait. It's it's, pe yeah, it's like people know that looking into the camera, it's a portrait. Now, if I showed you the, the take, there were times where she's in the chair working, uh, getting worked on, putting the ribbons in the hair. That's documentary <coughs> journalism, right? That's just a portrait. Do you understand that? Or, or? yeah, yeah, I get it. I just want to make sure that. <coughs> Yeah. And so I rethink it in my own head. I'm like, wait, am I, am I wrong in this? Then? No, I mean it's you know I I knew I knew when it I scouted the feature. It wasn't like a news story. It was like a I'm not like a it's not like breaking news. Yeah, this isn't breaking news. This is just people getting their hair done for Easter. So you know I I covered it. <laughs> uh, you know them getting their hair done, everything like that. And then, because I, her, she was my focus, I wanted to do a, just a nice portrait of her, a clean background. So I'm not, I guess I'm not understanding your question. But you, but you didn't tell the lady in the camo to move. You just no. waited for her to No, move. no, no, no. That, I would, that's the difference. That's, yeah, no, no. I, I was set up, shoot, getting ready to shoot like this, and then this woman came here and just started walking. I know, I, I don't, I don't, uh, even as a portrait, the only person I directed in the portrait, because you are allowed to, is her. I told her to stand there and hold like hold this because it's a portrait. That's that's ethically that's okay. But no, I didn't tell her, hey, can you up the way please? Right. Right. Because that that'd be the difference. Yes, 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 exactly. Does that answer your question kind of? Yes. Okay. Um, so action and reaction. Always know that action is going on in your frame. And action just doesn't have to be sports. And you've got to always be ready to record it and and you know great exposure great focus, things like that. Um, and action and reaction is often the exclamation point. Um, and, all, and also action reaction, it's the thing that viewers are always looking for. They're looking for a great story, great characters, but they're looking for some type of exclamation point. And so these are um, two, uh, a couple <laughs> celebrating their 70th wedding anniversary, um, but they renewed their vows. So Here's, here's the action. Beautiful. Here's the reaction. It was very special, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and this is the secret Santa. This, is, this uh, guy, I put a GoPro on him. Uh, he went out in Detroit and gave away $14,000 in $100 bills. And so the GoPro recorded people's action and reaction. Yeah. So he was wearing a chest, it's called a chesty. Um, it's like just basically like a, a harness, and the GoPro fits right here. So when they went to hug him, 
obviously it, it, it uh, blocked that, that moment, right? But it actually made for a good transition because when they went to hug him, remember how it went to black? Yep. That was a great lead in to the next scene. So you guys got to be thinking about those type things. It was, it was a mistake. It was a mistake. Like I didn't think that was how it was going to happen, but when it did, and I saw the edit, um, I was like, "Wow, here's a great chance for a transition to go to the very next scene." Um, I got to move on and go a little bit quicker here. Uh, so, discipline and patience. You got to make your students understand that every frame counts, even on an assignment. Every frame should count. Um, and then, challenge, even maybe for those who teach photography, next time there's a lesson, uh, a, a photography assignment. Tell them, hey, you know what? I only want 36 frames in this assignment. Do not delete anything. 36 frames. Because what that does is it forces them, just like back in the film days when we had 24 exposure or 36 exposure, I mean, it really forces you to make every frame count before you press that button. Make sure your focus is good, your exposure is good, your composition is good. You don't have a telephone uh, a flagpole with an Amer American flagpole growing out someone's uh, shoulder. All that stuff is very important. And it teaches them discipline, but it also teaches them patience to wait for the right moment. And every day, people are using cameras with, with uh, motor drives or you know, things like that. And they just aim at something and, da -da -da -da, and then they look at the edit and try to get it. Don't do that. Just, just take your time and be very, very patient. So openers and enders. Um, with video storytelling, in the first 10 to 15 seconds, you want to be very dynamic, very powerful. It's the opener, it's the opening statement of your video. You don't want it to be uh, um, um, you know, someone looking at a camera with a lower third with their name, hi, my name is so-and-so. You want something dynamic that makes a person say, wow, you know what? I think I'm gonna enjoy this, I'm gonna keep watching. And then you keep giving them more of those visual breadcrumbs. And sometimes an opener can be, if you have it set to music, you have really nice quick little edits and it makes it kind of catchy and interesting and they're like, oh, this is really, really cool. Let me, let me see what this is about. So a picture story I did, um, I spent six months embedded with Detroit Homicide. And um, it was pretty, uh, pretty uh, gut-wrenching and emotional. Um, and this was the opening, opening scene, opening piece, opening, um, a picture, um, this guy explaining to this detective how he saw this man walk into um, Wild Cherry Bar and put a gun to a person's head and shot him point blank, you know, boom. And then the story goes into it and things like that. It's just like that, oh my God, you know, and that's what you want. You want that to get, you want to get their people's attention to make, force them to want to look at more pictures, but also read, read the story to understand about Detroit in the homicides that go on, but that happens everywhere in the country. But you want you want that picture, and then this is um, the opener that I did on a, um, a six transport six transportation story that we did or that I shot for the for the free press. Six reporters. Six different modes of transport. One mission. Who could get from downtown Detroit to the Thinker statue at the DIA in Midtown and back to back? And then this is the opener of the, oh, This is the opener of uh, a shipwreck dock. It's a surreal and special feeling. You know, it's kind of otherworldly shooting up at the boat to explore a new shipwreck. and he is surrounded by history of the wreck that wants to tell his story. And with our discovery of the hybrid that sunk during the great storm of 1913, it's a tragic tale she tells. And so now for an ender, you want the ending to be so powerful that the, and when it's over with, the person just sits there and thinks about what they just saw, and they, they kind of digest it and figure it out in their head what it means to them and how it affects them. That's what you want with an ender. Um, and uh, the ender definitely helps summarize the message of the story, too. So back to Detroit Homicide. 
Um, this is Vernita, and she, with, uh, her, her son went missing. Didn't know where he was. Um, she, she thought he, she, he was shot and killed and stuffed in a trunk. She just didn't know. She'd heard rumors, things like that. So I spent two or three days with her as she put up flyers all over parts of Southwest Detroit to try to find them. Drove everywhere. She went around parks with a, a metal detector because Jamal had a, 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 a rod that in his, his um, leg from being shot years earlier. So she would just go around and just search. And if she heard a knock or a little, a little hit, they would start to dig and see if they could find it. Um, you know, they went into a, a woods because they smelled death. And I went with them. And I had a, um, a mask and I had um, a deodorant on it because the smell was so bad. And I thought for sure we were going to find Jamal or we were going to find other people. So as they started digging and I started shooting, turned out it was a bunch of garbage bags that had pit bulls in it, dead pit bulls wow. from, from fighting. Um, yeah. Um, but this is the ender. This is a family of Vernita digging under people's porches looking for Jamal because they were told, hey, I saw someone late at night burying something big under there. I think it was a body. And they, they were so desperate to try to find him, they would just go and they would knock on doors, say, listen, we're trying to find our loved one. We've heard he's buried here. Do you, can we move some of the lattice out the way and dig and we'll replace it, etc." Some people said yes, some people said no. Um, but this is how the, the whole project ended. It ended like, oh, are you kidding, you know? wow, people actually have to go through this, you know? And it, it, it raises lots of questions, but it also makes you feel empathy for people, some people, and what they have to go through, not just in Detroit, but in, Amer in America. Um, so that's, that's what an ender is. I'm gonna skip that, because I only have about 10 minutes. Um, all right, I'm gonna go show this. Um, so in terms of thinking visually, this is a video that really sums up everything I've talked about so far, wide, medium, and tight, and opening, opening enders, visual breadcrumbs. Honey, what do you see in this picture? Well, you and me. It's all I love, huh? 69 years ago. Wow, isn't that wonderful? Yeah, all those years we've been married. Look how young I look. Yeah, and look at me how young I look. <laughs> A long time ago. <laughs> I wonder where the time went. When you with me, what do you feel? Will you tell me? Do you love me more and more? Yes, I love you very much. Okay. <laughs> what made you in love with me? You were pretty, a young day girl. You told me you fell in love with my hair and my legs. <clears throat> Were you happy with me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Everybody. How you feel? I feel half and half. <laughs> really? Is that how you feel? Yeah. Uh, yeah. What the hell? I'm 93. <laughs> <laughs> of our marriage? Well, anyway. I would say, open your eyes before you get married. Keep them half closed after you're married. <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. Isn't that nice, honey? Yeah. yeah. We never argue, do we, honey? We talk things over, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> okay, honey. Yeah. Yeah. And we agree on everything together. Yeah. How about my cooking? You love my cooking? Yeah. What do you love this about my cooking? The spaghetti. Oh, my spaghetti? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, moving our legs, our arms, 
It's good exercise, and we love it. I, I put it in the right spot. <laughs> I really did. We got nine hundred. Tony's average was 180. I got an average of 117. <laughs> now, yeah. but then you had an, an average of 180. Yeah, that's what I could see. Yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> what I could see. <laughs> But you know what? I'll be my husband's eyes and his ears, but he'll be my brain. He never forgets a thing. So we're a team. So I guess that helps a lot too in your marriage. So my dear friends, Anthony and Sophia, are you ready to renew? Your marriage vows for the last 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> and please face each other now and hold hands. Well, it felt like we were getting married all over again. By the power of God the Father, I reconsecrate your marriage. By the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Amen. May Almighty God keep you together, healthy, happy, and many, many years to come. Congrats! Thank you. Thank you. Did you like dancing with me at the party? Well, yeah. I danced with you for a life. Seven years. Every <laughs> once in a while, I see the smile like the one I saw when we met. I've got no regrets. Yep, and it was beautiful. It was very special, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Everybody showed up. I love you the first day I met you, honey. I know you did. So I never <laughs> let you go. So I only have about 10 minutes. I'm going to blow through this part, which is um, more, to me, is more important than everything else I just talked about, which is important because it's foundations and building blocks. But this here is the key, so I'm going to try to hit, hit them really quick. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, my mentor, as a matter of fact, the guy that published, that, the guy that edited those pictures and developed those pictures in the free press back on July 30th, 1988, became a really good friend and mentor of mine. And when I was leaving the free press after a year long internship, he gave me this and said, Eric, if you learn to shoot with your heart, you'll move people's souls. Oh. And that's really, really important. Um, comfort zone. <clears throat> the best things in life are often waiting for you at the exit ramp of your comfort zone. That's so true. And it goes for video, it goes for, for, for photojournalism. It goes when you're a student, you see your students out to an area of town that they don't know, they, they feel uncomfortable with. You gotta, you gotta get out of this comfort zone and get here where that magic happens. That's where you grow, that's where you learn, that's where you become a damn good journalist, whether you're writing or shooting. So, I'm gonna skip that. Um, I'm gonna skip that, just because of time. Um, so how do you connect? How do you connect with people? Uh, your, your students have to have confidence in themselves but they also have, have to have confidence about what the story is when they're going in, so they feel a little bit more comfortable with it, right? <laughs> uh, people can see your uneasiness or your nerves, you know? And that, that's kind of off-putting. When you come in as a photographer with cameras, you're a total stranger, go in there with a damn good handshake, really good eye contact, be proud of who you are, what you get to do, and, and you, you show that, and the people are more open to you w when you are that way. Find things in common to talk about. And then, a lot of times, when I go in to, to photograph people, 
I, I go with one camera or no cameras just to get the know, just for them to get to know me. I'm a big, I'm a big six five guy, and to, to come in to your house as a stranger and you know I'm with the free press. <coughs> if I have the gear, you know, in, in the on the porch or in the car, and I we shake your hand, we start talking, everything, you're warming up to me. Like right now, you have a smile, right? So you're, maybe you're warming up to me. I don't know. <laughs> but, but anyway, you want to do that so that the person does warm up, they open themselves up, and then you can shoot portraits or you can do documentary, things mm -hmm. like that. That's what you want. And in terms of comfort zone, if whatever you do isn't challenging you, it hell, sure as hell not going to change you at all. And, and two more things. Uh, the experience. you got to remember that if your presence doesn't make an impact, your absence won't make a difference. And I say that because I was told a long time ago, when you go photograph someone, it might be the only time in their life that they're photographed by a professional photojournalist. <clears throat> make it an experience for them, make it count, make it special, you know, not just for the story, but for them personally. And so this woman uh, had a knee replacement and I had to go do a portrait of her. So, you know, I went in and you know, I put my cameras to the side, shook her hand, we started talking. I was telling her stories about a um, um, heart transplant story I did because she, she's a nurse at the University of Michigan. And we got to know each other and I made my pictures. And then she wrote this. Um, I just met Eric Seals for an article that he needed to grab some photos for. I was extremely nervous about having my pictures taken. But as we were talking, I realized that he had so many experiences and I almost didn't want him to leave. It was so nice to meet someone who could find something. Beautiful. And the things people take for granted. I work in the cardiovascular operating room at U of M Ann Arbor. His story about a pediatric heart transplant almost had me in tears. The story was short and just chatty, but I could tell the impact it had on him. You have a truly kind and wonderful person working for you and a better person for having met him. With all the talk of fake news, Eric made sure everything he photographed was as true as I was saying it was and left no room for doubt that his ethical and moral standards and his practice, practice were of the utmost concern in preserving the integrity of his work in the story. It's refreshing. I had a lovely morning. I hope the article turns out well. Thank you for your time. You know, that, that's like the payoff of what we get to do for a living. I mean, the awards are nice and Emmys or whatever. Those are great. You know, but those are tangible. That's something that came from her heart and it affected me, you know, and, and it got sent to the editor and et cetera. But that's our mission is, is to go out and, and tell stories, shoot wide, medium and tight, move people and represent yourself as you, but also you're a journalist. And you know, in these times we're under attack. So be honorable, be, be, be upright and just do your job so well that you get letters like that. And that, that's, that right there is validation for me. That um, these 25 years have, um, have worked for me. Uh, I'm gonna skip over, well, be curious. I'm gonna skip over that because I'm all this time. Um, empathy, in a world full of people who couldn't care less, Always be that person who couldn't care more. And I'm gonna end on this little short story. Um, these were two girls in Detroit, um, and they were walking to school, and it was 6.30 in the morning, it was dark, no street lights. Long story short, they both got hit and run, and the girl on the right was killed instantly. Three hours later, I had to go to the house. That's so damn hard, to go to someone's house right after they experienced loss. So 40% of our streetlights aren't working. So I had to go to their house to, make, to, to take a picture. That's so hard. That's so out of my comfort zone. Even though I've been doing it for so long, it's never the same. It's, it never, you never get over that, that fear, that uncomfortableness, you know, or feeling like a vulture. So I went in, 
you know, introduced myself. He was actually on the phone with the funeral home and told them, hey, I'm gonna call you right back, the free press is here. And I was like, wow. And I, I told him, you know, I'm, I'm sorry for your loss. And I'm gonna be very genuine. Tell your students to be very genuine, very real. Don't put on airs. And I, you know, I'm sorry for your loss. And I've got kids and I, I told them, don't understand what you're going through because I haven't, that hasn't happened to me, but, but I'm, I'm so sorry. So we started talking and I told him about the streetlight story that we're doing and how if he could tell his story to us briefly, maybe his voice would help make city government put more money into funding for streetlights, for LEDs. So I made a, a portrait of him with two of his other siblings, or two of his other uh, daughters. I spent maybe three minutes there, so I wanted to get out because I didn't want to take up too much more of his time. We, we published it, and um, two years, three years later, we had a um, streetlights. We had, the, Detroit is the biggest city in the country with streetlights, uh, I mean, LED streetlights. And I don't know if it was necessarily because of this, but I think his voice being in the paper and his picture really helped. And that's also the power of journalism. Um, can I just show this last one? So um, th this video really sums up shooting with heart. From being curious and having empathy um, and making viewers feel the same way about the characters that you're telling. And this is the Joe Murphy story, the, 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 the hockey player guy. And then I, then I have a quote and I'll end with that. Joe Murphy was a star at Michigan State. A rising star is the Red Wings' number one pick in the 1986 NHL Draft. But that was 32 years ago. We went looking for Joe in a small Canadian town of Kenora, Ontario a two-hour drive from Winnipeg. There's homeless people everywhere we turn. It, it's a bizarre juxtaposition. I mean, you have this tourist town that is beautiful. It's like Grand Haven or Crowder City. And you have an incredible homeless population. The weirdest thing about this whole story is everything he tells us. We don't know what's truth, what's truth in his brain, what, what is reality. He's a good guy. He's dealing with some mental health issues, and we don't truly really know what those mental health issues are, and I don't think he's, he knows. He's got a sixty life. He's sitting his old head hat. I got, I do these things. I, um, I tried to sell him with that. There's no market. Did you play with Stevie Eisenberg? I Yes, I played with him in the training camp in the games. But I called him Stevie Y. Why, why, Stevie Y? <laughs> no, but he didn't do well. Joe played for several teams during his 15 year professional career. He left the NHL in 2001 and admits to suffering a series of concussions that affects him to this day. I um, suffered a horrific one of them in 1990. Joe Lewis of all places. When I'm going 35k kilometers, going full tilt, man. That's like going full tilt. Your head into the wall, oh, man, and it falls. And I got, I got up too, because I there's just natural instinct, and I was all over the place. And it was, it was debilitating. I fractured my skull, everything. And it's on the thing that I was. I made mean, it off. I couldn't believe it made it off the ice, and, and it affected me. I think I, I think I played concussion the whole career. Man. Have you ever been diagnosed with anything? Well. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been diagnosed with some head issues, you know, concussion and everything, you know, just wrong. And as you grow, you really get to know your body when you're feeling good, when you're not, when you're hungry, when you need sleep, and, and when you need to do things. So, and then you can look back and I can see that I've had some good moments. But people in these places, like myself, have some mental illnesses. We do. Just at this gas station, they let you hang out and stuff? They've been very kind to me in the town here. They knew who I, I never told anybody who I was going through this, ever. I never said my name, what I played, and nothing, and no one knew. <laughs> I feel like I'm abusing the system, but I'm, people are giving me magnet muffins and giving me hamburgers and, and really helping me and dropping off tents. They've been very kind. I, well, I, I 
actually, I just feel that the people are complaining. I don't have that type of representation. So. <laughs> stuff. I started working when I was like 10, and then I'm doing things. You know, now I'm not working, and I'm just taking time. I don't, I just, I, I feel like I'm taking it, and it's okay. You know, I just, I'm receiving things now, and, and but she's, I, and I can't keep doing this. I just, I don't feel good, like, taking things from people. I, um, I woke up last night in the, in the, in the middle of the day, uh, the, a, a sleep one. I was, I was, I scored the game winning goal in game seven. I'm going to play one Stanley Cup again. It's just that type of stuff. Just all, you know, I love sports. You know, so you're dreaming away winning games again. When you talk about dreams, do you dream about having a roof over your head and three square meals a day? I haven't had one of them dreams lately. So uh, Jeff Seidel, the reporter, and I are planning uh, on going back later this summer to see how, uh, if he's doing okay, if he's uh, gotten the help he needed. Uh, people have been trying to get him to go to get help for his mental problems and things, and he's always refusing. And you, you know, it's like you can only do so much. And so we thought that this story in the video, uh, and it went a lot of different places in the Gannett network, that we thought maybe other people would want to help out after seeing it. So I'm gonna wrap up. Uh, the things of um, learned from, uh, do you see what I see? Hopefully, um, I didn't get to touch on some as of, of time, but you know, always be curious, have a lot of visual variety. You always want empathy. Get in that whirlpool mind when you're shooting or when your students are shooting. Make it an experience for that person that you're, you're doing the story on, right? Um, Another important one is assignments. Make, try to give them something in 24 frames or 36 frames, and it really challenges them to make every frame count before they press that button. And leave visual breadcrumbs and get out of your comfort zone. Um, I'm interested in that. Uh, so uh, they could only shoot 36 frames. Yes. Fascinating. Yeah. <laughs>